John Rick, it's all right, man. We've already started the conversation. It was going so well. I wanted to hit record. How you doing, brother? Hey, doing well. How are you, Jason? Man, I'm awesome. And I got, all right. One thing I didn't tell you before we came on is that my daughter is a University of Alabama graduate and she was in Tuscaloosa last uh, week. So being a, being a Knoxville guy, sorry, man, but uh, I got to tell you, we, we needed that redemption uh, as, as Alabama fans. So I can do you one better. I actually grew up an Alabama fan ah. and, and I'm, I'm one of few here in Knoxville and I was watching the game last week as well. And, um, you know, it was a, uh, it was a good win. <laughs> it was, well, I told Rylan, I sent her a text because she was there with a bunch of friends. They had gone, she lives in Atlanta now. She's graduated and they all went down. I said, well, be sure and smoke a cigar for me. And uh, it's, it's a weird year for Alabama, man. I think that uh, Melrose finally coming into his own as quarterback, but it wasn't that year where you know, kind of the, the MO for Alabama, it seems like the last few years is superstar quarterback, something happens another one comes in oh my gosh he's even better and that wasn't the the, the case this year and so it's, there's just so it's like i don't know what to expect of them i think could this team beat a georgia i don't know but uh somehow they're, they're just they, they, they at least they're getting a little bit better and better it's jekyll and tide isn't it yeah totally totally yeah, it's crazy. So, well, all right. So I guess instead of talking college football, well, let's let's talk about some other stuff. I mean, I got you on here to uh, talk about AI. Entrepreneurship's always a fun topic for for me. I mean, both of us said it looks like uh, looking at your CV from the past that you're uh, kind of a serial entrepreneur as well. And I know you're an entrepreneur because if I go all the way back to your early education, it's very much like mine. It has absolutely nothing to do with uh, kind of what you're doing now, which I think that is pretty common. Um, after all, I mean, I think Steve Schwartzman, uh, founder of BlackRock, I think he was a history major, you know, and, and, and so it's kind of funny how that works out. Same with uh, Ray Dalio. I don't think he had a business undergrad degree at all. Um, and so let's just get into it. So what I'd like to do, that being the case, just kind of, and, and I, I don't do the read of the bio and all that, especially whenever right in front of you, it's just, I just, I don't know. I know podcasters do that. They're probably a lot better than me and God bless them. But I'd rather you just kind of give us the story of where you've been and how you ended up here on the Jason Rice show. Yeah, that's a long journey. I'm not sure if we have enough time today, but I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to give you the, the two minute overview. Um, but you're right. I came out of undergrad as a political science major. Uh, they had this dream of going to law school, practicing law, you know, had an opportunity after undergrad to go work for my first startup. And completely changed the way that I, I looked at business, looked at profession, looked at career. Um, it was something that really resonated with me that I didn't have any exposure to growing up. And, you know, really just sort of fell in love with entrepreneurship. And fast forward a couple of years, I had an opportunity to go back and actually uh, pursue the law degree um, on a on a part-time four-year basis. Uh, so I was able to scratch that itch, uh, but knew pretty early on that I wasn't really interested in practicing. And ultimately found myself back in the operator seat, um, a number of startups, early stage, and um, in, in turn the real projects. And I tend to uh, to really gravitate towards those, the opportunities that uh, may not look uh, as pretty on the surface, but, but have a lot of upside underneath. I love that. That's exactly the first company I bought was the same deal, man. I mean, it was a tired old real estate brokerage. I'd never sold a house in my life. I was just looking for a business to buy and it's stressful, but it's also exhilarating. And I think that's part of what, um, if you're, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, I think that's part of it. It's just the excitement of kind of the unknown that's always there, the building versus maintaining. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's always been the case for me. So, how did, and let's just jump to the present. And I mean, we need to start talking about kind of how you built Riderly, where it came from. It's in a, it's a, it's a cool, sexy topic right now. Everybody wants to know about AI, chat GPT changed everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what's cool for me and what I was about to say before I hit record. And so I said, no, I got to say this uh, on, on the recording. I use this podcast purely for selfish reasons. I mean, I get to meet smart people like you that in this case, you 
deal with a software platform that is for creatives, I guess, writing, and it, it implements AI, which I think is really cool because I, as someone who is a creator, constantly trying to leverage AI to help with my shortcomings, of which there are many, I assure you, kind of tell me, first of all, what problem does writerly solve and you can and you can take it to here's how we came up with it here's what we were thinking here's where it was here's why it became exciting i definitely want to hear that but then just selfishly like what's the problem that it solves and um let's just kind of i want to unpack what is writerly and, and your involvement and why i should possibly implement it with one of my companies yeah and i think that's the question that everybody's still to a large degree asking is how do we use this and so if you look at you know fundamental technology shifts in our lifetimes you know if you have a, a you know a, the cell phone for example you know there's a clear value proposition there there's a, a clear need to solve you know fast forward to generative ai and the ability to create on the basis of of large language models and no doubt everyone is is really curious and they're really interested but how do you really harness it to you know, from a workflow productivity standpoint to accelerate, you know, uh, your own use cases. And I think we're still at the stage of largely figuring that out. The application layer technology, like the chat GPTs and the writerlies and some of the other peer companies in the space, we have the platform. Um, it's, it's in a no code format. It's relatively easy to enter inputs and generate outputs, but there's a real technical skill in terms of input generation, that's a real limiting factor for a lot of people. And so you know, the whole purpose of Writerly was to say, look, you know, if there's one constraint that we can help with, it's on the input prompting. Um, we're all okay at, at inputs, you know, write a blog about this, you know, write a social media strategy or a campaign around this or an advertising campaign around this. But there's real economic value to unlock the more technical and the deeper you get from an input standpoint. And so we approached it as if, you know, how do we sort of democratize prompt engineering? How do we <laughs> upskill everyone from a content team to a marketing team to a sales team? You know, people that have, that have grown up and entered the workforce without having to learn input prompting as a skill set. And how do we accelerate that? And so that was really the premise of Writerly is to say, how do we get you know, high fidelity outputs without the constraint on the, the human sort of input side. And we use a platform to do that. But what we discovered along the way was that, that took, you know, that, that took a manual step and made it, you know, much faster. So now we're all able to generate content, uh, much more frequently, uh, at a much faster cadence. But what we found as a company was, through this, there were some really vertical opportunities because our customer base on Writerly is, you know, we run the gamut. We have small companies, we have large companies, we have bloggers, we have heads of marketing. You know, it's a really horizontal platform. But through the utilization by close to, we got about 850,000 users right now, we found some really interesting vertical opportunities to solve some existing problems through generative AI. So these are problems that exist primarily right now in the e-commerce space that we can then take large language models and address existing problems instead of just sort of introducing this, this neat new tool to the world. So do you, is Riderly more of a standalone or, and, and here's, before I ask this question, here's what I've done, John, is I find myself as a, almost an AI software junkie and i'm bad about that i mean my 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 home office here looks like a graveyard of audio and video equipment because of this podcast ai has become the same way there is it's just my my computer is a junkyard of ai tools that i've tried so with riderly would i use that instead of say a jasper or something like it like is it more of like and, and here's the thing and tell me if i'm on the right track here so and, and just so the, the listener knows, when you hear these 
like there's a new job, the prompt engineer, that's becoming a thing. And and for the listener that doesn't know what the heck that is, essentially, it's someone who understands the limitations of AI and you create from Ron John, getting down to the true texture of what you're trying to yield out of it. Sure, anybody can say, give me, uh, write a 300 word essay on AI. And it would give you kind of just a little whatever. A good prompt engineer will say, will know to ask Give me a 300 word essay on AI that tackles the problem of voice language, getting to the granular level of a topic. It'll basically, you know, there was some uh, French philosopher that said, uh, judge a man by uh, his questions, not his answers. And I'm paraphrasing a good prompt engineer knows how to ask the really good questions. Right. So all of that babbling to, to come back to, with Riderly, am I going to use that with other AI tools? Because that's what I'm finding is that I'm piecemealing all these things together to kind of get what I want. Or is Riderly solving that challenge of I go in and I say, okay, give me that 300 word essay on AI. And Riderly has the built in intelligence to possibly say, hey, but wouldn't you want to ask this? Wouldn't you want to do this as well? Which is that kind of how it works? And I don't even know if there's a question in that. I, I know that was a huge word salad with some question marks and periods at the same time, but try to do something with it, John. So we'll follow you. Um, okay, good. So that's, yeah, that, that's the question. That's, that's the exact question. Probably the same word salad format that we asked ourselves. Um, so as of today, really, we're, we're all sort of, of all the companies that you've mentioned, we're all really template based, right? We are we're fine tuning these language models for the output. So that's kind of step one in terms of getting better quality outputs. Step two in, in our sort of roadmap is sentiment analysis. And this is where you get into some really interesting things with trying to predict, you know, is there another level? Is there a deeper level that this user wants to go that we can detect through the initial inputs? Mm. So we haven't quite we haven't quite released that commercially yet. And I think sentiment analysis is going to be sort of, you know, version 2.0, at least in the, the generative AI platforms, to really handle the user down, you know, their path to say, hey, we think, we know you're asking this, but based on either your history <clears throat> or based on some other information that we have, would it be reasonable to suggest that you may also want it to produce this, 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 or this? And almost, uh, you know, you recall the uh, the choose your own adventure books. Yeah, absolutely. Nice to read, right? Yeah, and and it's really not any different than that. You know, you can either stop or you can continue forward, and you can go left or you can go right, because we want the user to be able to curate and arrive at their ideal output or near ideal output much much sooner than they are today. It's it's a really large sandbox, and while it's great from that perspective, there's also some limitations for a large number of users right now. Um, but we're, we've got, we've got some plans to do some really interesting things around that. So I think what you're saying is exactly, you know, kind of where our focus is in the near term is, is taking down that sentiment analysis and what can we potentially suggest to make that result or that output better for our user. I love that. Cause so, so that makes sense. That's so kind of almost like whenever you go to a counselor, say, and you ask a question and the counselor's able to go, I hear what you're saying, but what I, re- but the question I think you really want to ask is fill in the blank. Right. And like right now, a great example would be how many people have Googled Israeli Palestinian conflict? What's the history of it? And if you could have with an unbiased response, and that's a cool thing. If you're getting almost kind of like a thesaurus, hey, I see where you use this word, but if you really want to spice this up based on the kind of the tone you've taken throughout the rest of this text, this word might fit a little better. This might give it a little more pop. It kind of be like if you asked about the Israeli Palestinian. Uh, Palestinian conflict. Hey, based on current events, as we have seen, is this what you're asking? What was the genesis of this initial conflict? Is it, so you can, because you know, I mean, let's face it, I don't think a, a bunch of people just, you know, right now with what's going on would be like, oh, uh, give me kind of the, some, some details. They would like something deeper to know why this has happened. And you guys are trying to solve that problem, which I think is huge. If you can crush that, that's huge because if someone as a creator, like a great example, I'm writing a children's book right now. So I went to mid journey. Okay. Cause I needed to get some, um, some illustrations and I'm, and so that's the latest AI tool that I'm trying to mess with. And, 
And I would love it if, and it kind of does this, it kind of gives you the, based on writing a children's book, this is the age level, it's Christmas. It'll give you kind of, hey, use these images. But for the writing, man, if you can nail that, that would be huge. And I guess... Okay, so one of my, and you may you may know her, Spaith Communications, which is in Dallas, which we were just talking about earlier, Mary Spaith, longtime friend and mentor of mine. So that's what her whole company is based on, is, is kind of, you, you know, making a universal message across an organization. Same language everywhere for FedEx, these large companies, we all are on the same page. This is the words we use. So writerly, if I'm writing a report, annual report statement, whatever, you know, investor relations, does Riderly help me stay consistent with my company's tone? And is that kind of the problem you're solving? Yeah. So brand voice, I think is what, is what we're really hitting on right here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Consistent voice, consistent tone. Because right now, if you go to Chad GPT, and I'm not, I'm certainly not picking on, on Chad GPT. I think it's a, you know, it's a brilliant application. Um, but it's, it's answering in the tone of the language model. You know, now if you were to prompt it and say, you know, answer it in the tone of Alex Trebek, you know, mm-hmm. there's, some, there's some creativity there. But when you start talking about the enterprise application, how does a brand use this? Um, one of the first things that we wanted to do was to have them, you know, an application layer that acknowledges what that brand's voice is and can ingest it and then can create outputs consistently every time in that brand voice, because as a content creator in a marketing team, if it's not written, you know, and sometimes you're, yes, it may create a new piece of content for you, but you're going to spend just as much time editing back into the, the, the voice and tone that you need it as you would have creating in the first place. So, you know, those are all things that are sort of table stakes in our opinion in generative AIs, and it has to be able to, to create a that. And we were one of the first companies to create a drag and drop PDF. So you could literally drag and drop a PDF of your brand guidelines and the model would train on it and then begin immediately producing according to your brand guidelines in a drag and drop PDF format uh, within the application. So oh, that's huge. Very proud of that. Um, but you're exactly right. If, if I'm going to have something that's going to write or create on my behalf, I need it to sound like me. Yeah. So it, so basically it does have it like you're talking about the drag and drop of the PDF. It has that learning capability to start to pick up on the tone of either the, of the marketing department, the branding kit that that's really helpful because, and that's one of the things that I don't even know, like I've written a couple of books and I try to be conversational in my books. I try to adhere to the, the Ernest Hemingway writing at an eighth grade level, but I really don't know that I know what my voice is because the the, the first ever piece of fiction I wrote was uh, based in the Renaissance era. So I kind of went on this, I mean, this totally language I wouldn't speak in. I was, I was kind of just, I don't know. It was kind of coming to me, but I've kind I kind of wonder, cause like guys that I read, um, James Clear, Dan Coe, James Altucher, the, these folks, uh, Chris Williamson, who has you know great podcasts. I'll, I'll take their newsletters, and I, I'm constantly looking to kind of find their tone. But it, but I guess that's one of the things that you guys are able to do. If I were to take, let's say that, well, okay, here's a good example. If I were to take uh, James Clear's newsletter, just save it as a PDF, slip it into Riderly, say now. Here are three topics that I want you to put out three more newsletters, blogs, podcasts, scripts, whatever, all things being the way they should, that should have a consistent tone. And if done really right, it will cover the topics at the granule, at the level I would want, right? You're right. And so that's where you start to get into some of the, the real core sort of ethics of generative AI, which is a whole separate conversation. Yeah. But for the purpose of your question, you know, uploading the structure uh, of someone else's work, yes, the language models have the ability to understand the nuance if there are, you know, consistent undertones of the style of writing, the language model will um, will pick up on that. But if you look at history, you know, you've, you've got, you know, you, you mentioned Herman Curtis Hemingway, you know, other, you know, famous writers like Grantland Rice mm-hmm. that had their own style that was unequivocally, this is, 
their style, well, you know, every one of their peers, not maybe not every one of them, but a large number of their peers, and then even generations to follow have tried to copy that style. Of course. I think from a from an artistic standpoint, there's uh, sort of an honor and acknowledgement of, wow, this is really great. So for the example you gave, to be able to say, look, this is a format that I love. You know, um, I see a great website and, and I save it because if I ever have a need for another website structure in the near term, I want it to look exactly like this. And whoever we engage with to design it, I want to use that as an example. Say, look, this is a, this is, this is what I want. Now make it for me. And this is in essence where generative AI is. And particularly in the example you just gave. Yeah. And see, that's one of the things too, that I think like in the case I was giving, giving, I was thinking like, if I am James clear, but you're right. I mean, somebody could totally try to rip that off, but that just only lasts for so long. And if that's why you're doing it, you're never going to be successful because you never have the passion involved. What I've learned that it really helps me with is it's just making my own writing better. So what I, what my little MO is now, I mean, I'll, I'll show my cards. I will just hash out like a blog post, an article, uh, my Vitruvian letter, which is my newsletter, I'll write out, you know, a long form article, and then I will take it and have it corrected usually for grammar, punctuation, some sentence structure. And that's one of the things I've learned is, and I don't know if writerly is like this. If you don't tell it to not, you have to give it real specific instructions or it will start to try to change your tone and your language and make it sound like something you never and it just it sounds robotic almost it's like well if i were if i were to if i had a robot taking dictation and saying here go be creative this is what we come back so that's and that's one of the things that i'd like to get your take on uh, gary vaynerchuk said it not too long ago and i thought it was it was spot on whenever chat gpt kind of blew up was that it doesn't have to be an either or it's like humans or chat gpt it's a it's it's a it's this and this it's the humans and ai and that's what i think is so awesome about uh about ai right now as and i keep saying ai as a general but as specifically as it relates to language and content creation is that it just makes you better and more efficient at what you're doing anyway no it's an augmentation and and i think gary v's 100 correct it's not this binary you know us or or it um, it's a tool and that's what it was, you know, at least at the generative level, that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to facilitate ideation. It's meant to facilitate editing. You can turn writers into editors, um, or you can turn writers into better writers. I think what we're seeing also as, as the world begins to experiment more with generative AI is its utility in, in certain types of content creation. We've largely been talking about from a marketing or uh, sort of audience facing or customer facing perspective. But, you know, what we're seeing are, are a lot of a really novel, um, you know, tutoring applications, which is another method of content creation. Mm -hmm. That content creation is just geared towards the education of elementary or middle school or high school students. Like there's so many really valuable things coming out of the ability to create certain types of content that it's a much broader discussion than where some, you know, want to take it because, um, you know, it's, it's a lot more controversial of having AI, you know, write a newspaper article. Well, the reality is, um, there have been listicles being produced for years and years and years before generative AI was, was on anyone's radar that were just sort of cheap imitation copies, mm -hmm. you know, um, this has been, this has been around for a while in, in, in other forms. But I think in the spirit of innovation and the spirit of, you know, let's use this, this novel tool and toolbox for, for good, we're seeing that outside of even business applications, what we're able to do with it from education, from an awareness, from, you know, again, content creation standpoint, the, the benefit, you know, far outweighs the, the negative at this point. Yeah. And I think that it also the, for me, it frees you up to, to do the things that really move the ball for humanity, your organization, like a guy like me. I mean, first of all, I'm the worst freaking editor that has ever existed. I'm awful. I mean, anybody that subscribes to my newsletter, they've seen at times and I'll, I'll go back and reread and I'll find one of my flubs. I'm like, Oh dear God, thank God. They know that I just, you know, I'm a terrible editor. 
So it saves me from that and it and keeps me from having to stay either, either one, having to go pay someone to edit my newsletter every freaking week or just me wasting my time instead of getting out and having this conversation instead of putting space on my calendar to edit whatever article I've written. It, it takes some of that out. And um, that's what I love about it. I think it, it's going to really free up people to do more things that are of utility value in the in the bigger scheme of things so so i i love it so how are you guys and well before i get to the how's the company doing and kind of where you are at what stage you are what is the interface like how do i interface with riderly yeah so we we invested quite a bit in into the to the ui ux um i think more so than than some of the other applications have at, at this layer we wanted it to be sort of aesthetically pleasing very intuitive uh very easy to navigate so interaction is really from a template standpoint. It's sort of what do you want to do? That's what that's sort of the question that we start with our users. Do you want to interface with a general chat? Do you need ideas, or do you have specific, um, you know, types of content or specific work that you need to do? And then we will um, we will guide you to the to the appropriate templates for that inside the application. Okay, so I'm looking at like Creator AI Cloud. So and, okay, let me look at this. So, new doc, advertising, e-commerce. I love this. It looks and it does have a little bit of a and not not to mention your competition. It's like what I'm familiar with. It does have a little bit of a Jasper feel, but better. I mean, I think it's it's got it looks a little more in depth. Uh, am I? Is that a fair assessment? I'm going to use that as a testimonial. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, no. no, and 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 to be fair, I think you know the Jaspers, the Right Sonics, the Rider Lees. Um, all of sort of the peer companies are, are largely using the same sort of, you know, application layer. Um, there's some nuance and differences in functionality, but that's what we did. We were, we had the, the ability to see some others that were first movers and we sure. said, Hey, this is like about their platform, but this is where we can improve in our opinion. And so that's what we did. Okay. Very cool. So how long have you guys been around? I think it was like, what, 2020 this, you were like an alpha or was that beta? How long have you guys been around now? Yeah, so we've been around since uh, really late 2020. Okay. Um, you know, really didn't come out with a product until, I'm sorry, late 2021. Didn't come out with a product until until early. Our alpha product was early 2022. We moved to beta in late 2022, about 11 months ago. Uh, once we had identified uh, some some real product market fit and some some applications and use cases that we could we could go after. And since then, it's been um, it's been an interesting eleven months in terms of user acquisition. We'll get to a users on platform uh, in our first year, and you know, for us, that's a big deal. Um, we we haven't taken on large venture capital sums. Um, we we are you know we were bootstrapped initially. We raised a um, we raised an initial round of funding um, to help you know finalize some product development. And we're, we're starting to take more of the appropriate sort of scale up steps at, at this point. But for, for us, you know, a million users in our first year was, was, you know, is a phenomenal, uh, uh, feat from really just a, an advocacy perspective and, and our users like our platform. So when you dig into the data, you know, it's, it's pretty easy for anyone to go out and say, Hey, we've got X number of users, but you know, how, how often are these users returning to the platform? How much time are they spending in platform? You know, those sort of metrics are really important to us and, and we're very strong in those categories, but more so than what, you know, Riderly has sort of, you know, offered from a, um, from an application experience to the rest of the world is we've been able to identify some other vertical opportunities, um, to take generative AI and to do some bolt on, uh, features and really, um, empower it to do some really unique things in, in sectors like e-commerce. And so we are starting to diversify from a product standpoint and it's a really exciting time. Yeah. Like I could see like on everything from like a, let's say a marketing funnel with automated emails and based on, I mean, you could like literally have someone that you, if you've got their product history, kind of what they like, I mean, you, you could really just kind of start do a five, a five, uh, a drip campaign where you're you're writing the, and they could be changed everything because that's kind of like back in the day which <laughs> these days means like 
<laughs> 12 months ago, back in the old days in 2022 or 21, you create a uh, kind of a drip campaign. You have somebody that goes in and and types out those emails, right? Gets them set up. They're going to go out and, and drip. But I would think that with something like Riderly, and I just looked at all your plugins with like Zapier and MailChimp and all, all the usual suspects, you could almost like have each one of those customized kind of in real time based on different habits, right? You could do that based on based on different habits. And what we're also finding is you can do that based on, you know, real time sort of events, market Dude, based sick. Or yeah. world events. Yeah. Uh, so anything that you can imagine that's historically been done from a content style, content standpoint manually, we're able to automate it. And not only automate it, but able to tie it to sort of real time important things that are happening in and around us from a market perspective, from a role perspective. Um, it's crazy. You know, my, uh, my, my CTO, you know, he uh, several months ago made a comment, just sort of, you know, in, in a meeting, he made a comment about, you know, imagine what it's going to be like when 90% of the internet is, is AI generated content. Right. Just, just take yourself there for a minute. What, what is the internet? What is our world going to be like when, when AI is, is generating 90% of the content? But it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, because I think what we're seeing with, with Google, um, with Microsoft Bing, we're going to start rewarding more enriched content. This is not just going to be puffery and fluff piece just sent out and, and taking up space. We're going to start moving to an era of the internet where it's going to be quality over quantity. And there will be significant quality pieces generated from AI that will be enriched from an SEO perspective um, down the road. So I, I'm very bullish, obviously, um, on what generative AI is going to do uh, in, in a lot of aspects of, of, of our life. But I think if we, if we sort of zoom out and look at its opportunity, look at the capabilities, um, there's some really good things coming. I agree. Like I'll, I'm always taken back to this story. When I was in high school, we had the uh, the stickers on the helmet for the big plays, right? And so, uh, you know, the, the really good players, their helmets would just be covered. Okay. And there was this one guy um, that uh, Michael Hicks, I think, I think that was his name, a uh, guy, he was, he was one year older than me. Dude was a stud, just an absolute stud. And he had no stickers on his helmet. He would not put them on there. So you had all these guys, the, the mediocre players, the really good players, everybody had some stickers. And then all of a sudden, Hicks would walk out, clean helmet, and he's the best freaking player on the team. That's kind of what you're saying. I think right now, it, it's everything is so crowded with, first of all, with just mediocrity. And if you if you allow humans, for the most part, to go long enough, they're going to go the path of re least resistance, right? So even with that, the AI prompting and the use of AI, you'll get all the people that are just going to try to be lazy and put out some crap that makes them look smart until all of a sudden you'll have it. And one of the best examples I can think of, I would love to have uh, and introduce the two of you is... Uh, James Altucher, who's probably my favorite podcast in the world and one of the most amazing entrepreneurs in the world. You have somebody like James, who's an incredibly talented thinker, idea, creator, and writer. And you leverage that with AI. He's going to rise to the top and you're going to be like, this is quality. This is, this, this is what I want. I think that's what, I think you're absolutely right on that. Well, it's, it's, how do you make a statement when everyone's making statements? So the yeah. helmets do, right? Like he made a statement when, when everybody else was trying to say the same thing. Um, we reward, I think, those that are different. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, I mean, they're, you know, you, know you, you see it. You, your inboxes are just getting spammed to death all day, every day. Um, you know, there's more newsletters out there than you can, you know. So how do you really find that signal to noise ratio? And I think those that, that are early movers are, are going are gonna to find themselves rewarded in terms of we're going to look for, for quality over quantity going forward. Um, we're all tired of, of getting the emails every morning of, let me help you fix your SEO and let me do lead generation. And, you know, these are all just hand automated, low vibrational, low quality communications. Um, and I'm really excited for, for sort of the next step and, and what that's going to look like. 
Yeah, me too. I mean, I'm excited about it. it when at first I was kind of like everybody else, like my stomach kind of uh, tensed up a little bit thinking, where's this going to lead? But man, and, and to, to the listener out there, if you will just kind of jump in and what's fun for me, John, is it's just discovering the new use every day. I mean, I'll have a problem now where I'm, I'm trying to use this with, you know, like content creation or even this podcast, like Descript, which is what I use now for a lot of my editing tools, which is an incredible uh, product for podcasting so much. And so much of that is AI driven that it, it, it uses. You just find these new ways to use it. I'm like a little kid in a candy store. So uh, to anyone that's out there, go, go get a, go find some free or, te or a, a test account or something like that. Like I want to, I want to test out riderly for sure, John, we gotta, we gotta make that happen. Um, it, it, and you'll figure out that it can make your life easier. Now, all right, I think we've covered the basics of AI. I want to get, and just kind of riderly and what you guys do and, and what's, what's in the future and how it's going to enhance our lives. But one of the things we talked about before you came on that I want to cover, just use an entrepreneur and everything. And, and just because again, as much as I'm just kind of selfish with my podcast, I love talking about health and wellness and kind of geeking out on that stuff. And you may mention that that's something that's become incredible or always has been incredibly important to you. And as an entrepreneur, it's, it's really, really important. I could not agree more. I think that our bodies and our minds are the single greatest business tools you will ever have it's the only one you got with you no matter where you go and if it's not sharp everything else is gonna is gonna operate you know suboptimally um what do you do as an entrepreneur as a business builder to to keep your to keep yourself kind of at as as close to peak performance as you can what what, what are you doing yeah so for me it comes down to blocking blocking my calendar you know, there's a two hour block for me, um, three days a week, really early in the morning. Yeah. That block for me says, you know, not that anybody would be booking a meeting between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m., but that block is sort of a placeholder for me to have, uh, to have time to go to the gym and to be able to sweat and to be able to think about something other than, than work all the time. Because as, you know, anyone in business who cares about what they're doing, you know, you're, you're consumed with performance. You're consumed with, with questions, you know, all day, every day. So you kind of look for those little micro escapes. And for me, the gym is, is certainly one of those, but it doesn't just stop there. You know, that for me, it carries over into diet. It carries over into, you know, I'm not a big macro counter. I don't weigh my food, but you know, from a, from a protein standpoint, I'm making sure that I'm, I'm sort of fueling myself the correct way. That's, that's important. And then, and then sleep. You know, you've got to prioritize sleep and recovery and rest. And, you know, having been through startups early in my career where I deprioritized fitness, um, diet and sleep. And now having gone through it at this point in my career where I've, where I've certainly emphasized it. I mean, it's, you know, I've been on both sides of that coin. And it hands down from a performance standpoint, from a mental acuity standpoint, I'm, I'm in a much better position right now to not only sort of, you know, serve myself and my family and, and my company and my coworkers, um, but to really take on a lot more. It's just being, I think, from a human performance standpoint, optimization. Um, and that's sort of where I draw a lot of it from. I read a lot. I consume a lot of content around it. Um, and, you know, I want to build for longevity. And I've seen the, I've lived the founder days of late nights and junk food and um, that's not building for longevity at all. And, and I think one of the, you know, one of the things that we can do a better job of in, in the tech startup world is emphasizing health and wellness among founders a little more. I have seen for that a real emphasis on behavioral help and mental help um, options. I know there's a lot of venture funds out there right now that are making that a priority for the founders that they invest in, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. But I think there's a lot to be said for the physical side as well. Could not agree more. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. So uh, Jess Tranquina in Austin, her she and her husband, Delphin, they have Generator Athlete Lab. And when she opened it up, or when they opened it, they honestly thought that it was going to be mostly uh, former athletes around Austin, like Lance Armstrong and like really kind of weekend warriors and triathletes, that sort of things. What she has found is that most of her uh, client base is 
more like a Tim Ferriss in Austin who's been into Generator Athlete Lab and the 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 founders and the entrepreneurs. I think that there is definitely a movement where entrepreneurs are realizing that man, you can really 10x this thing if you take care of your body and your mind first. And you mentioned that the sleep. I want to find out. Uh, let's let's trade some notes here. So, who do you said you consume a lot of content? Who are you reading? Who who are some folks that this stick out as like, yep, they've got it right. I'm gonna I'm gonna track with them. So you know, I think I've never been somebody that says, "Hey, this is this is who I'm completely aligning myself with as a as a continuous learner." I want to listen and subscribe to a number of different voices, and so those voices, just for example, you know, listeners may you know may know David Goggins, yep. right? Andrew Huberman, there you, um, go. you know the the voices like that from a performance and optimization standpoint. And look, do I? Do I think that 100% of their stuff is completely reasonable uh, for non-elite athletes uh, to do? No, but I think that by and large, where their message is, um, it's you can't beat it. And the amount of, of content that we can consume, you know, for for free or little to no money around these topics, we you know, what a time to be alive when you can interface with experts like this. And, and somebody like myself who's on go a lot. I'm, I'm a podcast junkie. Um, I consume information, uh, when I'm mobile and, and that's where I listen to when I'm at the gym a lot of times it is open on a podcast and, and work out to that. But I, uh, I love, you know, those are examples of the types of voices that I like to sort of surround myself with and then sort of draw my own conclusions on then based on life experiences of myself. You, and how cool is it? So Andrew Huberman, since you to take one that you mentioned there. I love that we live in a time now where a neuroscientist from Stanford University is a celebrity. That's that's a cool, that shows that we're kind of with as much as I will be the first to say that we are regressing as a species in, in the aggregate, I'm afraid. It's also kind of cool that you have one of the most popular podcasts uh, and most popular figures right now is Andrew Huberman, who's a neuroscientist. I love, and the cool thing about that is it's, it's good for uh, health and wellness, but also goal setting. I mean, Huberman covers just a lot of topics and every single one of his podcasts is, is to me, it's almost like a little mini uh, masterclass. It's so good. One of the things I, one I will recommend to you is, um, uh, and I'm going to just blatantly, shamelessly toot my own horn because I'm not the one that makes it good. Every Friday, uh, my business partner and friend, Dr. Gus Vickery, he is, he's a health and wellness expert on longevity, uh, precision medicine, and takes a very fundamental approach. I mean, his, in our company that we have together is called Authentic Health. And essentially it's Basically, he trains people to manage their health at the cellular level. Just a very great guy. I mean, he, we kind of describe him as the Peter Atia for everybody for the, you know, that's because I love Peter Atia's content. This podcast knows that I'm a fanboy and I, I like it, but you know, guys like you and I, we will dig deep and geek out on the more granular level, which is where Atia goes. What Gus and I try to do every Friday is kind of, create that little mini masterclass on longevity and health and wellness molecules that everybody could listen to guys like you and I, who may do this a little at a, at a little more high level because we just, we like it to the, the person that uh, does not, isn't into that has no idea who Andrew Huberman is, but they want to be healthy and live longer. So every Friday, man, uh, I, I'd love to get your feedback. There's a whole series of them. So check those out. And then we've got some other things too, that we're working on that uh, might interest you, but yeah, the Huberman's a good, a good one um, as far as just uh, health and wellness. Now, what are some things that you, now that you've started really kind of dialing in as a, as someone who's focused on your health, what are some things that you don't do that you once would do just kind of taking it for granted? Has, is there anything you've cut out that, that I'm out on that? So strangely enough, the, the one thing that I cut out that I didn't think I was ever going to cut out was the reliance on the wear. Um, I was a big what oh. band guy for, for many years. Yeah. And I love the data, but what I found myself doing was there was almost this placebo effect in the morning that I'd want to check my numbers, you know, how well yep. did I sleep? I'm there. And, 
let I would let the numbers dictate how I felt rather than my body and my mind dictate how I felt. And I thought I, I became a little bit too reliant on what the data was saying. And the data was really good. And I love Whoop as a company. Um, I think the product is amazing. But I have enough KPIs to look at during the day and to focus on um, that I, I got into a place in life where I wanted to sort of remove. And that was a natural place for me to start because I know that if I am if I am doing the things that I should be doing on a day to day basis with consistency, that you know how I feel, you know what I feel when I wake up in the morning is the source of truth, not necessarily a wearable. Yeah. So I'm not going to let my wife listen to this episode because she'd be like. Listen to him. Listen to him because this damn aura ring, man, it, uh, it's, and it's the sleep. It's the exact same one that you're, it's the first thing I do, man, because I don't sleep with my phone in my room. So the first thing I do is I get up early, I walk out and to the kitchen, get my phone, look at this less sleep number. <laughs> and it's just, and my sleep has been, my scores have been crap lately. And, and then see that. And so that feeds into my vanity because I like to think, I mean, I'm the improve always and always guy. I'm supposed to have perfect sleep and all this stuff. And, you know, I've got a podcast, you know, so I've got, you know, I'm, I'm fancy, you know, I know all the things and yet my sleep's crap. So then it just, just beats on my vanity and the things that I think I'm supposed to be good at. And so I'm with you, man. I'm, I probably, and I've thought about putting down my aura ring for a while. I've done all of them too. You know, I was a big Apple watch guy when they came out and then, um, then just went to, uh, you know, they had a really cool, I didn't do the whoop strap. Um, instead I opted for the Amazon halo, which is a real cheap down and dirty did not have nearly as good of data. I say nearly as good. It was comparable for just kind of like what I was doing. And then they finally eliminated it. it never did take off. So they don't have it anymore. But then I switched to the aura and I like it, but man, I'm with you. I probably get a little bit too obsessive with the numbers. So, well, you start to see your sleep decline, and then the first you know two hours of your day is really consumed. It, you know, it sounds like you and I are a lot alike in this. It's you know I'm almost consumed by you know everything else checked out. The the, the time of night that I went to sleep, but the routine was the same. You know, what was it about last night that skewed that data? And so you begin just focusing on ultimately things that are far less important in your day and then take away yep. aspects of way in your life. Um, yep. So yeah, that's, that, that's what I did. And, and I've had, I've had good results. Um, but yeah, don't, you know, if, if your wife doesn't need to hear that, then I would, uh, yeah, why not to, to pay attention. To this. <laughs> All right. Well, the last question I'll ask you just because it's, it's something that, I mean, is near and dear to me. Um, I'm a voracious reader. I always want new recommendations. Uh, Anything that you're reading right now, and, and again, I'm making a, a bold leap. I mean, it does sound like we're pretty, uh, pretty equally yoked on a lot of things. So I'm assuming that uh, you grab a book on occasion. What do you like to read? You know, I think there was a. Uh, so this is going to sound well. It could could be really interesting or really ridiculous, depending upon your your perspective. But right now, we're reading a lot of journal articles, we're reading a lot of of, of peer reviewed uh, publications, and so. My head of product at Riderly um, brought something from his time um, at, at Harvard into our organization, which is really, um, really novel, at least from a from a startup perspective. Um, but we do what's called a journal club every Friday, and every week we have a signed publication, published reading um, from various journals around the transformer model and generative AI, around you know different things that are happening in our industry, in our sector. And we have everybody in the company as a part of general club. And so people in marketing, you know, HR, uh, they can participate to really sort of understand the why we're building what we're building, be able to have a forum to interface between product and, and engineering and marketing and HR and sales. And so that's what we've been uh, sort of heads down in for the last seven months is really reading a lot uh, for general club. And it's, it's been fantastic. So it's very little room for outside reading. Um, but I will say that I'm, I'm still maintaining my cadence on podcasting, uh, and, and consuming from that standpoint. But it's, uh, you know, to, to most people that can be pretty boring. Uh, peer reviewed articles are not the most exciting, uh, pieces of literature, but they are uh, quite often the most uh, informative. 
Well, it's one of the things too that Stephen Kotler recommends is that you should read at least one thing that you would never. This completely out now. I know you're reading stuff like in inside your field, probably to to en- enhance what you're doing. But I, that I've tried to do that, and I'll try to at least print off uh, uh, print off at least one. Uh, whether it's usually it's health and wellness, I'm trying. And like right now, as a matter of fact, here's a good example. So yesterday, I had this idea that I want to pick one molecule, one supplement, and just go deep i mean narrow and deep on it so that if john ricketts was to ever ask me about this particular molecule i could just give you this just i would know but not because i want you to think i'm smart but because i do take a lot of molecules i do you know gus and i mean that's one of the things that's kind of gus's wheelhouse is these supplement stacks that he has his patients on and stuff for longevity and i want to know them at a deep deep granular level i want to know all the metal metal, metabolic reactions and stuff and so as that's kind of pushed me into reading some more just kind of uh yeah more dry uh content but that's good for you 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 have a favorite molecule from a literature perspective right now (laughs) <laughs> well, well, I I don't. The, I will say this: creatine is the one that I probably have gone the, the most narrow and most deep on. Used to be just kind of bro science. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I had Dr. Jose Antonio on here to talk about it one time. Who's like a, the the expert on creatine for that reason? When I started down that path, when I started like oh, I'm really going to dig deep. Again, great well, great thing we got a podcast. You can just reach out and say, hey, I'm doing some research on creatine, and he was awesome man so uh so anyway so that's the one that i've probably uh i've done the i've gone deepest on of all of them thus far all right that's gonna be on my uh that's gonna be teed up for my flight to for my flight to dallas this afternoon is that that episode all right i will i will make sure i send it to you directly and then i'll tell you this man it's it's one of those that now just kind of that and creatine I'm, not, I'm making no recommendations i'm not a physician i'm not a doctor i'm not prescribing anything i'm just saying what i have done since i've done the research is of all the things that I take, John, five milligrams of creatine happens, or five grams of creatine happens every day, no matter what, for brain function, recovery. The benefits are just stupid, and it's cheap. It's a cheap molecule that everybody can can do. It's uh, you don't have to worry about spending a ton of money. So anyway, so there, there we go. Take your all at once, or do you split it up morning and night? No, I just take it all at once. Um, and I, it's usually in my, like I have, I make this green monster protein goop in a bowl every day. That's my, my lunch every day. And it goes in with that along with a lot of other stuff. So, so that's it, man. Well, well, John, this was fun, dude. And I'm glad we met. I'm glad to know that we got mutual friends. And then, uh, yeah, if you, uh, ho- hopefully we can connect in Dallas sometime and, uh, that's it. Where can people track riderly you, I know from listening, doing a little research, you're you're wanting to be more outward facing. So how can people follow you and your progress? I think personally, LinkedIn is probably the best place. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's just John, J-O-N, Ricketts, R-I-C-K-E-T-T-S. Um, the website, right on the website is easy. It's writerly, W-R-I-T-E-R-L-Y dot A-I. Um, the second product out of writerly is Ecom, which is E-K-O-M dot A-I. And I, I don't really mind sharing my email address, um, but it's John, J-O-N, at writerly.ai. If anybody out there has any questions or, or wants to connect, I'm um, always happy to. Awesome. John, this has been fun, man. I hope that you won't be a stranger. I want you to come back on the show, and uh, it's been a good time. Let's do it again, Jason. Thank you. All right, brother. Thanks for joining us. Folks, thanks for listening to The Jason Rice Show. He's John. I'm Jason, and we're out. Well, that does it for this episode of The Jason Wright Show. Thank you so much for listening. This has been a Texas Titan Media production. Fourth Wall did the music. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Please consider going out to jasonwrightnow.com and signing up for the Vitruvian Letter. Also, please go out to iTunes. It takes like 30 seconds to just leave us a five-star rating. It does wonders for the podcast. I would be so grateful. And with that, until we meet again, go crush it and endeavor to improve always in all ways. I'm out.